We are going to go to Chefalou, but real quick, I live just um, outside of the city of Florence in Tuscany, and this is where I live. It's the castle of Popiano. And I rent from the Count and Countess who live in the castle, and I have this little farmhouse right outside the castle walls with the roses over the door. Um, we're going to head straight south, though, and go to Chefalou. So you can see um, Sicily here in the middle of the Mediterranean. And we're going to see the village of Chefalou, which is right here on the north coast of Sicily. Um, almost halfway between Palermo, which is here, and Messina, which is over here. And we're also going to talk about um, Marzamemi, Vendicari, and Scopello on the mainland. And then we're going to talk about the island of Lipari, which is in the Aeolian island uh, chain. And we're going to talk about Favignana and Levenso, which are in the Egadi. So the Egadi islands are over here off the west coast, and the Aeolian islands are up here off the north coast. So here's what Shefalu looks like um, from the beach. It's been settled since prehistoric times. There's that huge kind of rocky outcropping and the original settlements, I mean, literally Bronze Age were up here on top of the rock. And the name actually comes from um, a Phoenician word, kephas, which means rock or stone. The Greeks came in here, you know, this is, you know, the history of Sicily we've talked about uh, a couple times here. Um, the Greeks came in when they were trying to basically colonize the entire Mediterranean basin, and they set up shop here in Shefalu in the 4th century BC, and they called it Kephaloidon. Um, of course, the Punic Wars took place here, and Rome beat out uh, Greece and Carthage to take over. That was in 254 BC. They Latinized the name to Shefalodium, and so we now call it Shefalu. So you can see the town here is built on this little spit of land um, that really just juts out into the sea right below this rocky outcropping. There, it's a walled village, so it's kind of interesting that fishing, of course, is an economic force here in Chefalu. So they're tied to the sea, but they're also really protected to the sea. And I remember one writer described it as they have their, they kind of have their back turned to the sea. So um, the sea, you know, was their kind of um, the source of their economy really, but it also you know, presented some danger to the seamen and the sailors. And it also presented danger to everybody in the form of Barbary pirates. And so this basically is a wall. And there are a couple of the gates in the wall. There's one right here and I'll show you what it looks like from the other side, but you could close that and you could close it really good. And you, they probably did that every single night because once the pirates landed on the shore and they got in, then you know, it ensued. So um, that was a common problem for centuries on the coastline of Sicily and also southern Italy. So when you're walking around the city, it kind of looks more like this. You don't necessarily always get a big wide open view of uh, the Mediterranean Sea. It's mostly these tiny little windy streets. And every now and again, you get a tiny little piazza or maybe a glimpse of the sea. Um, there are, here's that, here's that gate that I just pointed out. So when you're coming from inside the city, you actually come out onto the beach through this tight little gate. Again, you can see here how they kind of could have closed it. Um, they probably had double doors with, you know, that were barred in order to make sure that the pirates couldn't get in. On the left is, um, some remnants of the medieval period. Those were actually wash basins where you go to wash your clothes, you know? So we're going to talk about Chef Alum, and we're going to talk about um, two men who really left their mark on the city and kind of shaped the city the way we see it today. And the first one of those people is um, King Roger II. This is, there are two different portraits of Roger. He's a Norman king. He um, became king in the year 1130. Um, and he actually left his mark on Chefalou because um, he was... Um, Coming back in 1131, one year after he was given the crown, he was on a diplomatic mission to Naples. He, he went by boat, of course, and so he was on the boat coming from Naples back to Palermo, and there was a terrible storm, and he, you know, barely made it ashore. He and his men barely made it ashore at Chefalou, and so he decided, okay, this is the spot. I'm going to found this great cathedral, and he founded the cathedral, which is now the Duomo of Chefalou, and it's dedicated to Il Santo Salvatore, the Holy Savior. Um, because he, of course, was saved. Um, it is basically the only kind of big open space in the city of Chefalu. So here you are in um, the Piazza Duomo. It's this very imposing um, Norman structure with those two kind of blocky towers on either side. You can see that better from here. And then to get in there, it's kind of built up on a little bit of a rise. So to get there, you have to actually walk up these steps and then you can kind of um, come into the entrance. 
from the back, you can see what a massive complex it is. So it's all of this, you know, cloisters and there was a spot for a monastery and the big piazza out front. Um, so the plan was to build this enormous complex and to decorate the interior fully with gold and mosaics. And then um, Roger was actually going to have his porphyry purple marble sarcophagus installed here. Um, the church was begun in 1131. Um, 20 years later, this part was done and the mosaics were put in. And then Roger died and his successor just wasn't real interested in Chefalu. And they finished the building, but they just didn't bother to finish the decoration. So when you see the interior of the building today, it looks like this. You can see the apse with the sparkly mosaics. And there's also the choir and the vault. And then the rest of the decoration is Baroque. And the building itself is this medieval building that you can see here. So we're going to take a look at these mosaics. They are considered the finest mosaics, the finest Byzantine mosaics, not just in Sicily, but in all of Italy. And they're actually on par with the Byzantine mosaics that were created in Constantinople. Um, and we'll see why in just a second. So let's zoom in here on the apse mosaics. And you can see. Um, it's dominated, as is the entire church, as soon as you walk in the door, by what we call the Christ Pantocrator. That's Christ when he's kind of blessing with his right hand. He's got the Bible in his left hand. He's holding the Bible, and it's open to John chapter 8, verse 12, which is written there in two languages, both Greek and Latin. And that's the verse that says, I am the light of the world. Who follows me will not wander in darkness, but will have the light of life. Below Christ is uh, the Virgin and her position is called Oran. She has her hands out like this. She's kind of working as her, the intercessor between us and Christ. She's surrounded by the archangels and then below them. So here's the register with uh, the Madonna. And then below them are apostles and evangelists and saints. So let's take a, a look at a detail here of the Christ figure. So what's so important here is the mastery of the Byzantine mosaicist who was in charge of the decoration. Christ's face, how, not just Christ's face, I'm showing you that, but all of the faces here in this uh, decorative program are very much not stylized types, they're actually faces, and they've been given sort of the attention of a portrait, and you can see here the intensity of Christ's expression, and of course, this is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of feet above you, so when you're standing here, you're kind of looking up at this figure, so look, taking a close-up at it is pretty kind of remarkable. It's almost like he's staring right into you. And then even closer up, take a look at how the mosaic artists used their tested aid. All mosaics are composed of square stones of different sizes and different colors and different materials as well. So notice the um, kind of the color range that was expertly used here to model the volumes of the figures. The way, you know, here, just take a, you know, even here you can kind of see how they've used the um, tested aid in different colors just to kind of represent that volume of, of your thumb. Uh, of Christ's thumb in this case. And then another cool thing here is the different range of finishes that they used. So the gold background is very sparkly. You can see how it's sparkling here. This is the gold background. It's super sparkly here. It's like not even kind of overexposed in the photograph even. The gold came from North Africa. Um, and the Normans actually conquered North Africa in order to get the gold. It was coming out of Sudan. Um, so those gold tests that I were most likely made um, in Sicily. Um, the colored uh, stone came from and the glass stones came from Constantinople directly and there's a really interesting use of kind of glass finish here so there's sparkly gold there's the colored uh, kind of matte finish that's used to um, model the face of Christ and then there are these glass pieces look at how the red line here of his eyes, the crease of his eye, the ear, the black line of the hair, those are actually glass pieces that have a different kind of a shine to them, just to kind of give some more movement to these mosaics. Here's that register below with um, the Virgin, with um, Archangel Michael. Um, in addition to sort of good proportions, good drawing, they're very kind of plasticizing. Um, you can really get an idea here of how they were modeling the drapery, really lovely, um, kind of volumetric folds of the drapery. It wasn't just lines pretending to be drapery, like they're actually trying to make it look like drapery. And the drapery is even different. Mary's wearing what looks to be sort of a heavy either um, velvet or um, wool cloak, while 
um, Archangel Gabriel's wearing a loros, and that's silk. Look at the fine folds here of the silk that he's wearing. And it's silk that's encrusted with jewels, pearls, and colored enamel bits. And this loros was what was worn by the royal family in Constantinople. And it was also worn by the Norman kings of Sicily. So there's this connection between Sicily and Constantinople. And there's a real connection directly between Constantinople and Shefalu. And you can see that here on the left, um, Archangel Michael from the Duomo at Shefalu. And on the right is an archangel um, of one of the rare mosaics that's left in what is now the mosque of Hagia Sophia in what is Istanbul. So this would have been Constantinople, the church of the royal family. So royal court artists were working here. Look at the similarities. Uh, look at the way the hair is treated look at the kind of the way the wing but look at the wing first of all there's these are peacock feathers so the archangels have peacock feather wings and look at the lovely kind of shading from black to white to kind of aqua marine on this case blue and black again and they're loros so there's this real connection kind of stylistically between these two works you're looking at shefalu on the left and constantinople on the right and then come to find out that the patriarch of sicily was brought in by roger ii roger wanted to conquer basically the world the normans wanted to take over the world and they were working on that they were you know they went into england they were working they were going on crusades to the holy land they took over literally all of southern italy um, and sicily and they were you know they had sort of the Eastern um, Roman Empire in mind. That was the royal court at Constantinople. So it turns out the patriarch of Sicily in this period was a cleric from Hagia Sophia. His name was Nelios Doxopatris. He's the um, cleric from Hagia Sophia who Roger brought in to be patriarch of Sicily and he would easily have brought a retinue with him including mosaic artists. So it's very possible then that the mosaic artists of the royal court of Constantinople were brought directly into Sicily. And we see that in the Sicilian school of mosaics um, in Italy. The other school that's most well known um, for this time period is the Adriatic school. So think about Venice and think about Ravenna. Those were not started by artists from Constantinople, um, this sort of cosmopolitan royal court situation. Those were, that whole school was started by more provincial artists probably into Greece. So it's interesting to see here that on she in Shefalu in Sicily is this direct contact with Constantinople in the year 1140. Um, these um, mosaics were uh, restored by the second person who I'm gonna talk about who had a really big impact on the city of Shefalu. Um, he paid for their restoration out of his own um, funds in the 19th century. And he is, um, Enrico Piraino, Baron of Mandralisca. He was, um, he lived in Shefalu from 1809 to 1864. And he's this real eclectic intellectual, um, and there's a museum that was his house that is, uh, we're gonna take a look at some of the, the works in that collection. But he was very much dedicated to a host of things. Um, one of them though was the uh, welfare of the lower classes in Sicily, um, this kind of, you know, sort of tenant farmer class. And he really was very active against the feudal system. The feudal system had been abolished in Sicily in the year 1812, but there were remnants of it, such as the bishopric of Shefalu literally lorded it over basically everybody by charging a tax. They called it the gabella. And the gabella was charged on anything. If you made a broom and you're gonna sell it, well, then you're gonna pay a tax to the bishopric of Shefalu. They had taxes on charcoal the the poorest of the poor of the poor go into the woods and make charcoal and sell it door to door well they the, the bishop got a tax on that every, every piece of ceramic that was fired i'm not talking about fancy stuff i'm talking about this stuff the stuff that people cooked with every day every piece of ceramic fired there was a tax on that that went to the bishop so that kind of thing um baron mandraliska realized that this was just crushing the peasant class and keeping them down he really worked against that i mean he literally sort of participated even in rebellions um, against the um, kind of feudal culture, and then was very active also in the unification of Italy. So in 1861, when the country of Italy was unified and Sicily joined um, the country of Italy, he was active in that and actually became a member of the Camera di Deputati. So he's kind of a congressman. And he went to Congress basically taking with him, he was there to um, literally kind of help legislate for the poor folks in Sicily. That's a discussion that's still going on. Here we are, you know, 200 years later. but. Um, he definitely made a stab at that. He also, when he passed away, he had no heirs. And so he left all of his belongings and his wealth to the city of Shefalu. And he um, 
um, left very specific instructions. He started a high school for boys. He started a school for girls. And he left specific instruction that they be taught to read and write, not just how to sew and cook, um, you know, not just home ec. He also created a night school for these peasant farmers so they could at least learn to read and write and do basic arithmetic. Um, and then he left all of his, his library, his own publications and his very rich art collection um, in his home as a museum for the city. And so we can visit that today. And he really had a wide ranging um, series of interests from natural history, archaeology, numismatics, um, fine arts. You can see here some of, he studied birds. He actually wrote about migratory birds on uh, in the Aeolian Islands and on the north coast of Sicily. Um, he had, this is a, there's a word for this. It's now escaping me some kind of fancy scientific word. He had an entire collection of mollusk shells. Um, in his fine arts collection, this is, probably the most important work and it's actually one of the most important works in Sicily and this is a painting dates 1465-70 it's done by Antonello da Messina we've talked about him before um, he's from Messina his name's Antonello and this is known as the portrait of an unknown sailor That's what this has been called for a very long time so Antonello da Messina was one of the principal Sicilian painters he was one of the first painters in Italy to work in oil paints and he was actually in Venice for a long time and um, would have met Netherlandish painters and had you know, access to all of these kinds of uh, materials in order to paint in oil. What he did that was so spectacular, hey, this is pretty early, okay? This is 1465. This particular painting has been compared with the Mona Lisa. That's 1503, okay? So there's a 40 year difference between this painting and the Mona Lisa. So what he does here is he works in oil paints to depict light and atmosphere and very fine detail like Nether Netherlandish painters do. But Netherlandish painters often make very flat images. He's given it all of this volume. So that idea of creating volume in a figure is very Italian. So you can see that he's got sort of, he's kind of taken the best of both worlds here in order to create this image with this just beautiful kind of radiant light. This figure just kind of comes out of the shadowy background. There's a lot of depth here. There's very soft contours, that enigmatic smile. So those are the things that actually um, have been oftentimes by art historians compared with Leonardo da Vinci, that enigmatic smile, and then the way he uses his oil paint. Um, so remember, Leonardo came along. Leonardo actually may have met Antonello in Venice, and then uh, 40 years after this, Leonardo started the, uh, the painting called the Mona Lisa. So here, I had this other, this is, uh, it's, this painting travels a lot, it goes to exhibitions. And I, the photo on the right here is it's return to Sheffaloo after an exhibition. This is in the newspaper. The newspaper, everybody in town's thrilled to know that the Antonello is back. And I've included that here so you can just see the size of it. Like this very tiny little panel. Um, we actually think that it's not an unknown sailor. Um, we believe this was the Bishop of Sheffaloo, whose name was Francesco Vitale. He was a Pugliese guy from Noia. Um, Nola Anti, and he was appointed bishop by Ferdinando II. That's, you know, Ferdinand and Isabella. Ferdinand appointed this guy bishop of Sheffaloo. Um, the painting seems to have come into the Mandrelisca collection, however, from Lipari. Somehow it ended up in Lipari. So Baron Mandrelisca, his wife was from Lipari in the Aeolian Islands, and they spent a lot of time there, and he actually did archaeological digs there um, and worked on his collection. And most of the kind of uh, Greek um, remnants are found in this area here where this kind of, it's kind of a castle, a big fortress on this area. You can see it here too. Um, so you're looking at the port of Lipari with um, Castellaccio here. So the Greeks were here um, also relatively early, even before they were in Shefalu. And they were here because uh, there was a um, supply of obsidian. So they're making knives and trading throughout the Mediterranean. They also found here alum, which helps them helped fix colors in cloth. So this is another um, natural element that was really um, um, sought after. So that helped, they traded again uh, throughout the Mediterranean, this substance. And they were trying to kind of protect their Mediterranean basin from incursions from the Etruscans up above. So they kind of maintained a piece of the Mediterranean and they did a really good job. And the Ellen Islands went through a very kind of prosperous and peaceful period to the point that they were actually minting their own money. And they had a theater here that was super active. So you can see 
um, the coin from the Mandarilisca collection. This is a, it actually says Lipara, this is the mint of Lipari. There's a dolphin with some stylized waves. And then on the back is Hephaestus. Of course, this is the guide of, um, you know, the forge, the fires. And he lived in the volcano at Vulcano, which is the next island over. So there's a picture of uh, Hephaestus holding a hammer in one hand and his drinking cup in the other. So on Lipari, um, Baron Mandarlisco was kind of discovering all these objects, and they're, of course, in his collection today. Things like the theater masks. So the Greek theater on Lipari was very active, and for whatever reason, Lipari has the they were on, found on Lipari was the largest collection of these theater masks. These are actually from Greek comedy, and so the actors, of course, would wear masks. These are two female figures, so male actors would wear a mask to be a female figure. He also collected pottery. So these are very nice attic vases, so that is Athenian vases, and these are called red figure. Y'all may have seen other Greek vases that are black figure. Um, black figure were the original ones invented by the Corinthians, and then when the Athenian um, pottery workshops kind of took over, they were painting in red figure. And you can see here are two um, uh, mythological scenes, and you have on the left um, Aphrodite and Eris, and then on the right, Dionysius with his drinking cup turned down. He's already drunk his wine. He has his Tirso in his hand. And if any of y'all were here for our very first lesson, he is surrounded by the satyrs. Remember the dancing satyr. So this is Dionysus with his drinking cup. He's already drunk his water and his wine, and he's holding on to his staff with the pine cone on the end, and they're about to start whirling like a dervish to go into a trance. So that's what's happening here. And they're red figure because you can see the background is black and the figures are in red. So that's a particular way of doing this um, that was invented by Athenians. The Athenian workshops kind of petered out in the fourth century and the importance of ceramic workshops actually moved over to Southern Italy and Sicily. And here is my favorite ever um, vase. This is kind of the style of a Greek vase. It's red figure on a black ground. This is a crater. This was um, a big, kind of a big um, uh, vessel that was used to mix water and wine at a banquet. So, you know, Greeks uh, were very wary of, um, you know, drunkenness. And so they didn't actually just drink straight wine. They actually drank wine mixed with water and other substances as well. Sometimes they would add resin or whatnot. So they would kind of, or spices and that kind of thing. And this is the vessel where that was done. So this is a Sicilian production and it's the scene of everyday life, which makes it really interesting. So you're not looking at, you know, Aphrodite. You're actually just looking at a guy who's, you know, it's the fishmonger. You're looking at the fishmonger and a client and they're sitting here in a, um, you know, just a market and a kind of a market stall. So the other thing that's cool here, so this is about 380, 370 BC, and it's kind of this lighthearted scene because it's also caricatures. If you look at the protagonist, things are certainly, some of the, it's all very real, but they're all sort of exaggerated forms and um, shapes. Look at the, you know, the huge knife that's, you know, cutting off a slice of tuna from this tuna that's already been, you know, he's on the butcher table. And, you know, here's the head of the poor thing that's fallen off. And I love, look at this tuna over here. This was supposed to just be, you know, a dead fish. But he's like looking at you like, help, get me out of here. And he knows he's next, right? And then I love also the, the, um, the buyer has kind of this skeptical look on his face. You know, he's got little wrinkles in his forehead. He's got his hand out with the money, but he's almost like kind of almost like he's not so sure he wants to buy that tuna. And I also love how nicely this is drawn. Whoever did this just had a real facility of line. Just check out just the little kind of loose black lines he used to uh, indicate here the fold of the drapery on the sarong over here in this guy's little wrap. So cute, I think that's really nicely done. It's also evidence of tuna fishing in Sicily. And we have a lot of evidence of tuna fishing in Sicily and they've been doing it for a long time and they've been doing it in a very particular way. Um, to, the word for tuna is tonno. And so people who fish tuna are tonnarotti, and the place where they live and work and keep their vessels and fix their nets and process tuna is called a tonnara. And the way that they, Lorenzo, mi senti? Mi puoi scrivere nel chat? Sì, ti sento. Mi scrivi nel chat, tonno, tonnarotti, tonnara e poi matanza. Okay, so tonnarotti are the fishermen who fish the tonno, and they live in a tonnara, which we're about to look at, and the way that they fish tuna is called a matanza, and this is the way they do it, and they've been doing this 
since probably the 800s AD and maybe before that, um, we're not real sure, but at least the 800s AD. So what happens is tuna come from the Atlantic to spawn in the Eastern Mediterranean. They come in through the Straits of Gibraltar. They pass the coastlines of Sicily going and also on the way back. And um, they were fished um, in this very particular way where these nets are set up. This, these are what you're looking at is underwater, okay? Um, so this is the, the kind of the Isola de, de la Rete, the island of nets that's set up in order to practice the Matanza. So what they do is literally from the shore all the way out to this uh, series of chambers, they set up what they call the pedale. So the tuna swim in, hit the pedale and are channeled into what is called the Camera Grande, the big room. Then they, you know, they're, they're fish. They don't swim out, they keep swimming this way and they end up in the Camera Piccolo, the little room. And then finally they end up in the Camera de la Morte, the chamber of death. And you can see that there's nets, calati, or dropped here, bottom of the chamber of death. So what happens is once all the fish, once there's a concentration of tuna in the Camera de la Morte, men, lots of them, get in boats and they sail out to form a square that, you know, uh, um, kind of uh, delineates the Camera de la Morte. And these fishermen start hauling the nets up like this to bring all those fish up to the surface where they can, you know, basically kill them and bring them on board. And that's what it looks like this. So they've been doing this for centuries. And um, it's just kind of now dying out for various reasons. One, of course, is that tuna are overfished and the stocks of tuna are low and they're actually not allowed to do this very often. Um, and there's only, because of decline for other purposes, um, in Sicily anyway, there was one active tonara, which we'll look at in a second. That's the one at Favignana in the Egadi. And I'm gonna show you that uh, in a moment. That's the one, that's probably what this is because they continued up until um, recent times practicing the Matanza. So you can see all these fishermen are on their boats, hauling up these nets and bringing all these fish up to the surface who are starting to get the idea of what's going on and they're not real happy about it. All of this is being led by a figure called the Raiz. And here's the Raiz here. He's kind of the head tonarotto and just sort of makes sure everybody's coordinated properly. He even decides when to set the nets, where to set the nets, and then kind of coordinates the work as they are bringing the fish up. Um, so here's some photographs by the great um, photographer Sebastião Salgado. And um, these were taken in 1991 at Favignana. So here's um, in the interior of a tonara with all the nets stored. Here's some fishermen as they're kind of setting up at the Camera de la Morte. Here they are working to haul the nets. And you can see the fish are kind of being concentrated up towards the surface. And then finally, they haul the fish on board. And then once the tuna are in the boat, there are also their work songs. They're called Shaloma. And there are work songs that um, these they would sing to kind of keep the rhythm up as they're working and they're always talking about the boat you know those are kind of the lyrics of these songs so once the tuna are on the boat they bring them back into the tonada and the tuna actually worked in the tonada so what you're looking at here is the tonada at a place called Martzamemi it's no longer working as a tonada it's an adorable adorable little fishing village with great restaurants and here you can see somebody set up a banquet scene in here um, in one of the old workspaces and it's just got this great piazza so this is no longer in service. This is Martzamemi on the southeast coast. Um, some of these tuna fisheries um, went into decline because just the trade, they were making salted tuna. They sold tuna fresh and they sold tuna salted and went all over Europe. So as soon as at a certain point, Northern Europe started sending down salted herring and they started sending down bacala and all this stuff. And so the market for salted tuna just kind of dwindled. Um, the um, fish population dwindled. Other things kind of interfered and every, you know, one by one, these tonada started to disappear. So this is the tonada at Vendikri, just north of Martzamemi. At one point there were 66 tonade on the, um, the coastlines of Sicily. So Martzamemi that we just saw a moment ago is now just a cute little village with you know, shops and restaurants. This is Vendikri. This whole area is now a nature reserve. You can go bird watching, they have pink flamingos among other things. Um, on the northwest coast, this is one of my favorites. This is the Tonara of Scopello, northwest coast. You can see the Tonara here um, with this great little watchtower here. This is what it looks like today. I used to, I started coming here in the 1990s and this is what it looked like back then. This is this ancient watchtower. Again, they're watching out for pirates. Um, and the, um, you can see just rows and rows and rows of the um, 
anchors that were used to keep the nets down are there and then the boats were stored up in here so today this is actually a little kind of a bnb type place you can actually stay there it's really it's very charming there's the um, interior courtyard here a couple little beaches this is what it looks like from the inside you know you get a nice view of the ocean um and here is favignana we're, we're going to go take a look at favignana this is where they're still practicing the matanza when allowed so this is you're looking at the Egedi Islands from up above Trapani. So this is a city called Trapani. Lovely, lovely little visit. And this is uh, Favignana, Levanso, and Maritimo. So here's the port at Favignana, which is dominated by this huge, enormous tuna fishery, the Tonada that belonged to the Florio family. And what they did, which was really interesting, here's a cool interior view with one of those boats. They invented canned tuna. And they invented canned tuna in the mid 1800s so that kind of gave a little uptick to the tuna production so they were pr previously salting tuna in big wooden barrels and that had kind of that was just sort of people weren't that interested in it anymore and so they figured out how to can tuna under oil which i'm sure people were doing in their homes but that had never been done on an industrial kind of level and they started doing that here at the florio family tonada in favignano and i actually love canned tuna so tonight we're going to make fresh tuna and also uh, do a recipe with canned tuna lastly um, on the island of Levanso. So here's the little port at Levanso in the Egedi Islands. On Levanso are these prehistoric cave paintings. I hinted at this in our um, in the announcement for this program. So this is the little tiny port at Levanso. You you arrive in this little port. You can take a, a boat from Trapani or from Favignana. Then you have to walk, and you walk around the edge of the island, and you, then you get to this. See the cave here. You kind of have to belly crawl for a little bit in this really tight little chamber and then you pop in and you're in this cave here and then you can actually see back here are these paintings so these are um, prehistoric cave paintings they date from between 10,000 bc upper paleolithic period to 3500 bc late neolithic period and you can see their stylized men kind of doing like a little kind of ritual dance or something some animals and then two tuna fish is that great so fish and tuna in Sicily from way back. So we're gonna make two tuna recipes. We're gonna make one Sicilian recipe, which is called tonno abutonato, and I'll explain what that means. Um, and those are the ingredients I'm gonna use. And then we're gonna make vitello tonato. And vitello tonato is actually a recipe from Piedmont, and the version I'm making was taught to me by a chef from Malta. So this is not necessarily the traditional version of vitello tonato, but that's what we're gonna make. So let me see if I can get out of here. Stop, share. Okay. So here we are in the kitchen. Um, all right. So I'm going to start off with the tuna amutonato. Lorenzo, voi. Sì, ti vedo. Mi vedi, ma voi mutare anche te perché non so come sì. mai oggi c'è cioè, troppo rumore. So we're going to start off with this tuna, the tonno amutonato. And this is a piece of tuna that I have. And I was, I've, I've kind of, I've done, I'm doing this in steps. So I just want you to see how lovely this piece of tuna is. I actually soaked it in salt water and it got a little bit kind of gray looking, but it's actually this great red tuna. Um, so this is a recipe that is made this time of year. The tuna are running now and it's um, kind of simple and it's kind of, I don't know, it's just kind of interesting. Amutunato means basically speared and stuffed. And so I'm going to poke holes in here. Let me get my mint. I'm going to poke holes in the tuna and fill them with pieces of garlic that are wrapped in mint. So that obviously just then kind of gives this great aroma um, to the entire piece of fish. So you just kind of stick a knife down there into the fish. And you, this is a relatively small piece. So I think I'm going to use, I think, four of these. Um, I have a bigger piece going, I'll show you in a second. So wrap the garlic in a good amount of mint. Lorenzo, si vede quello che sto facendo? Si, si, si. Okay, grazie. E poi, and then just kind of stick that down in here. And it just kind of, it just kind of sucks up. There's one, one here. You turn these on too. This is the night of technical difficulties. Lorenzo, non mi, non mi parte la fiamma. Va bene. Controlla il gas se è aperto. 
No, guys, they're perfect because I'm not on my other side. Quindi, that's okay. We just had to have one more technical difficulty. But fine. All right, so let me stuff some more in here. So the um, interesting kind of the idea of tuna fishing in Sicily. I mean, it's just so kind of rooted in their culture, and they have traditionally used every single cut of the tuna. And I just saw a Facebook post by um, a colleague, his name is uh, Pino Maggiore, he has a restaurant in Tropani, and he was making La Tumie, which is literally fried sperm sack. And it sounds weird. They eat that, they eat, they actually uh, cure the egg sacs to make botarga. There, a friend of mine wrote a um, recipe book. Um, there are something, almost 30 cuts of tuna. They ate the ocular muscle. They had a recipe for the stomach and whatever was in it. I mean, they did this sort of, it reminds me of literally the American Indians with the buffalo. They used every single piece. And the Sicilians traditionally have used every single piece of the tuna. They, you know, no, nothing goes to waste, you know, absolutely zero. So I'm using a, what I could find because I'm not in Sicily. And the shop where I went to buy this was selling this cut, which is kind of a sashimi cut. Um, I would prefer to have a fattier cut for the recipe I'm making, but this works fine just as well. So um, I'm going for it. Elaine, Sandra asks, why do you soak the tuna in salt water first? Uh, Laura, it kind of purges the tuna and um, there is sort of, you know, there's a little bit of sort of pink, almost kind of bloody liquid left in the tuna. And so it just kind of cleans it out and gives, gives the tuna a cleaner flavor uh, when you're cooking with it. So that's the point of that. So here's the tuna prepared for cooking. I'm just gonna salt and pepper it. And then um, it gets cooked in olive oil. I'm gonna get all the pepper. There. So this gets cooked. Let me see if my burner will start. Does not want to start. There it goes. This way y'all can see it a little better. So the tuna gets cooked, and I've kind of done this in stages for y'all because um, the tuna gets cooked um, in olive oil with a little bit of garlic for to kind of really give a crust all the way around. And I've done that already. Can y'all see the color here of the tuna? I'll bring it up closer um, so you can see it. So I've really given it some color on both sides, and so I can kind of see that there. Um, so this is kind of a, literally almost like a stewed meat. So you cook it on all sides like you would, I don't know, like a piece of beef that you were gonna cook, right? You kind of wanna sear it. And then, um, again, with garlic, and then I'm gonna pour in some white wine, and when the white wine boils off, I'm gonna add, tomato, tomato paste, and bay leaves. And then it just goes in for a very long cooking. So let me get this hot and then I'll add everything. There's my wine. Elaine, how, how long uh, you soak the, the tuna in the salty water? The tuna gets soaked for an hour in salt water. It's kind of like a brine too. I mean, I think the, you know, the tuna um, kind of um, releases some of its liquid, but also kind of absorbs the salty water. So it kind of helps with the tenderness of the tuna and also with flavor. So I'm burning, I'm gonna just boil off the wine here. And then I'm gonna add what is um, tomato passata. This is, you know, I made this last year. Tomato passata, um, nothing but tomatoes. I didn't even put any salt in here, just tomatoes. And then I'm also gonna use some, what they call um, estrato or stratu. And this came to me by way of somebody's Sicilian mother, and I'm very happy about it. This is tomato paste. Look at that. Amazing. So this is some old lady in Sicily took her tomatoes, summertime tomato crop, ground them up, spread them out on a big, um, basically, they call it basically one of these, a big wooden kind of table outside under the sun and just stood there and stirred it for a day, two days, until all the liquid absorbed. They salt it first, though, to help some of the liquid go away. So this is what's left. It's just literally just like the 
whatever matter is left in the tomato after all of the liquid um, is drained out um, just from the sun. And it's this super powerful tomato flavor. So the idea is to do a combination of tomato passata here. And tomato paste, which is so thick. This is also super salty. Um, so you might want to taste your tomato paste before you add it in. Um, this one's salty because they had to put a lot of salt on the tomatoes uh, to do the, the sun-dried method. So I'm not going to add a lot of salt to the um, sauce. I've salted the tuna, and there's a lot of so salt in the tomato paste I just added. So I'm, the tomato paste, I'm kind of trying to get it to melt into the passata. And I'm going to add some bay leaves, which I've just discovered that dried bay leaves are a little bit less invadente, invasive, than fresh bay leaves. So I'm using dried. I'm just stirring all this around. I'm going to get it to kind of bubble good, and I'm going to turn it on low and cover it and let it go for about 30 minutes. So, Lorenzo, say, mi scrivi l'ora così so quando devo togliere questo pezzo di pesce da là. Sì. There's a reason why, because you use a ceramic bowl instead of metal pot, oh, um, is a question from Linda. Okay. Thanks for the question, Linda. I'm using ceramic because it's really good for things that are long cooked. It just keeps a very even, good, low flame, kind of low uh, heat. And um, I really like them. I've had these for a long time. I don't always use them. I don't often do things that are cooked, uh, kind of long cooking, but they're super convenient for that. And so um, I like to do it. And the person who gave me this recipe, he swears that it tastes better this way. Oh. I don't know about that, but it does cook really well. So, I mean, I kind of enjoy using them, so that's good. So I've kind of turned the fish around. I've covered it in tomato sauce. I'm going to let it go for 30 minutes. In the middle point of cooking, I'm going to flip the fish and add just a little piece of mint. So cover it and turn it down. So when you're done, what you get is, um, and this is sort of typical of any Italian um, kind of, you know, sauce type of a recipe. What you end up with at the end is sauce for your pasta and a piece of meat that you eat as your second course. So you sauce your first course, which is your pasta, and then you serve the meat as a second course. And of course, you have to kind of move the fish around as you're cooking it, and it's a little bit delicate, it's so a little bit fall off. So your sauce gets, um, you know, little bits of, it, it absorbs all the kind of good flavors from the tuna, but it also has little bits of tuna, so it's really good. And if in case something doesn't fall off, you have to kind of break it off. So like, make sure you get some little bits of tuna in your pasta sauce. So we'll do that at the end. I'll plate up some pasta for you. Um, let's see. And I'm gonna show you this vitello tonato. So this is basically a recipe that you eat in Piedmont. And Lorenzo's laughing because he wants to know what the heck does Vitello Tonato have to do with Sicily and nothing, but the tuna vendor sells tuna and so whatever. And at the fi Favignana, they make um, canned tuna. I'm just going to show you some canned tuna from Favignana. Hang on, I have to get it out of the pantry. So I think I have a source for y'all for tuna and I'll give you that tomorrow. I'm using um, Nino Castiglione canned tuna straight from Favignana. I don't think they did the Matanza to get the tuna, but there is with this caravel. Um, so it's this basically kind of roast beef beef that is boiled in a broth. And I'll show it to you. And you boil it in a broth. And my butcher gave me the, the trick here. And the trick is to boil it in broth with a little bit of um, vinegar. And then you let it cool in its broth and you keep it in its broth. That this meat is very, very tender. So that's the base. And then on top of it, you put the tuna sauce. And the fun thing about the tuna sauce is that A, it's really good on the beef, but it's also good on anything else. It's a good dip or spread. It doesn't have to be eaten on the beef. I kind of like it that way, so I'm gonna do it. But um, it's a very, it's a versatile sauce. I have to make some space here. Hang on, sorry. I'm gonna get rid of this, I'll bring it back. So the tuna sauce is basically kind of a mayonnaise made with tuna. 
but my friend, the chef in Malta, showed me how to do it with yogurt. So instead of using a whole bunch of um, raw egg yolks, you actually use yogurt. So the ingredients are tuna, and this is my yummy Nino Castiglione tuna. So try to get some good quality tuna. Good quality tuna is excellent, as you probably have realized um, after that talk about tuna fishing, and you know, it's processed right there. Again, I'll send you a source tomorrow, but most uh, grocery stores are offering, you can find some good tuna. It's not chicken of the sea. Sorry to chicken of the sea, but they're not doing it for me. So the ingredients here are tuna, salt packed capers, which I left the salt on, so I'm not adding any more salt because I have salt here. Capers are so good. These are from Pantelleria and um, Salt packed kind of keeps the nice briny flavor of the tuna without, I mean, the capers without kind of covering it up with vinegar. And then a couple of anchovies. Y'all know me, I love anchovies. Notice how lovely and fresh they are. They're kind of pink. They're nice and firm. They're very good. They're going in here. They just kind of give an umami kind of flavor to all this. It just sort of Elaine, nice sorry. sweet flavor. Uh, tuna and the anchovy are uh, oil it packed. Oil or, packed. Or natural. Oil packed. Let's see. Both. Oil packed anchovies and oil packed tuna. And capers under salt. Salt packed capers. Yes. And this is Greek yogurt. And then I'm going to add that and I'm going to add a little bit of olive oil. And I'm actually using a Calabrian olive oil because I felt like it. This is uh, Consuelo Garzo, the Garzo sister olive oil. Let's see. So this is one of those dishes that a lot of times people bring also to like a potluck supper or something, you know, or a picnic. I see this a lot at picnics and it doesn't have to go on top of the beef. Again, this is a good dip for vegetables. Uh, it can be a spread on a, you know, kind of a crostino type of a thing. There we are. So I'm going to show y'all how to put it onto the beef though, because it's kind of funny. Let's see. Here we go. When you use on the beef, you have to say, welcome back to the 80s. <laughs> Lorenz Lorenzo thinks that Vitello Tornato is from the 80s. And it may be, but it's really good. So whatever. Yeah, it's wonderful. <laughs> I, I love it's, it. He thinks it's dated. That's okay. It can be dated. All right, let's see, I'm gonna put, I just put it in my pasta, I'm gonna throw in some salt. So, Lorenzo, mi dici dieci minuti, per favore? Or si. alto, alto, alto dieci per la pasta? Si. Si. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead, let me get my, let me figure out how to do this beef thing here so I don't make a, it's all drippy because it's sitting there in its broth. So the cool thing about the beef though is because it can be, you know, boiled beef that's left to sit in the fridge for a long time can be really dry and unappealing. And my butcher gave me this awesome trick of just letting it soak in its broth. And I think the vinegar in the broth really helps too. So here's this tiny little piece of beef, kind of roast beef beef. I trust it so that it kept a vaguely round shape. I'm just gonna slice it into rounds. The first one's never very pretty, so I'm gonna leave it out. Not that you can see it because you slather it with yummy tuna sauce. I'm also not very good at slicing thin. These ought to be super thin slices. I'm gonna try, I'll try to get some super thin ones. I'm not doing a very good job at that. Okay, so this is served on a platter. Just super thin slices of beef, kind of barely overlapping. I need a couple more. So Lorenzo, is this kind of like what you would eat at sort of a fancy restaurant on like Sunday lunch in the 80s? Is that what this is? <laughs> Sorry? 
Questo è, è dove, dove si mangiava questo negli ah. anni 80? Tipo, no, tipo in un ristorante in no, elegante per pranzo? You can also have it in, in your house, for, for example, on uh, some holidays like uh, Christmas. Oh, well, okay, Christmas. Yeah. That means it's like a fancy dish. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. All right. So there's the meat, just kind of an overlapping um, scaglioni. And then I'm going to take the yummy tuna sauce. So again, you can just, you know, use this for vegetable, you know, to dip in raw carrots or something, or you can spread it on top of the, it's not super runny. You can add more oil if you want it to be runny. I kind of like it thick. Recipe, and then it gets topped with um, capers. And start just like this. They Sorry. actually sell this in the grocery store here. You can buy, like, you know how you can buy sushi in the grocery store in the United States? You can buy a vitello tonato, or pre made vitello tonato in the grocery store, right? That's a la co op. A la co op will vendono già fatto. Giusto? Yeah. You can use also pickles or uh, some uh, little onions, borretane over See. there, or capers. Or, uh, all I, I just like I like to overdo the capers. Yeah, you can decorate with whatever you like, but um, there, the little onions are more 80s, I think. So here you go. This is vitello tonato. Doesn't that look great? Lorenzo's jealous. I know you are. <laughs> <laughs> I take my bike and I come. Okay, good. <laughs> Lorenzo's bike is an enormous motorcycle, by the way. Okay, I think my pasta is not quite done yet. I'm going to show you. The, um, we'll, I'll serve the second car course first and the first course second. So I'm going to take the tuna out and we'll see what it looks like. Where am I going to put it? I'm running out of platters. Uh, I have some question. Okay. For you. Uh, the first, Michael say, is the sauce served at room temp? Yes, or warm? room temperature. Yeah. No, it's all basically room temperature. Even the beef is um, brought to room temperature. So, and, yeah. And is veal or beef? Um, this was, you know, I always buy what they call vitellone, which is not quite a veal, but not quite a big calf either. But um, I'll, and I'm going to send you the recipes tomorrow. I'll tell you exactly what cut to get. Um, it's not veal. In the, 80, in the 80, we use veal, but uh, now I think we use beef. <laughs> yeah, we're yeah, they're up. <laughs> they grew up. <laughs> but also it's called it's called It's the Vitello. same, it's no, the same cow. <laughs> it's the same cow. In the 80 it was a veal and now it's a, a cow. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but Lorenzo, Lorenzo, it's Vitello. Vitella yeah, is Vitello. veal. This is yeah. Vitello. So Vitello is It's a Vitellone, yeah. Vitello. And and Kathy say how do you serve it? The Vitello Tonato is yeah. served literally you just like you know have a serving fork and you can give everybody a couple of slices yeah. or this would be one serving i'd eat the whole thing um so you serve it like that and then you just eat it on a plate with um a knife and fork um the tuna let's see here so the tuna i've made one ahead of time so i can show you what it looks like when it's done and the sauce is reduced and all of the yummy tuna has kind of flavored the sauce. I'm actually going to break off a piece of tuna. I don't know if y'all can see that I can't pick it up because it's boiling, but a little piece of tuna is kind of about to fall off. I'm going to help it fall off and just kind of um, break it up so that I have some bits of tuna in my sauce for my pasta. And then I'll show you what the actual piece of tuna looks like. And you really need to serve it. The sauce is literally, the tuna is great, but the sauce is heavenly. And so I am actually not a big lover of tomato sauce on fish, not my thing, but, um, this is really good. And can y'all see how this fish, the, um, riesci, kind of the grain of the fish. A portarlo più vicino. See. Pensity thing. So the, the tuna is literally, it's just sort of, you know, you don't have to cut it. You can just kind of break it up along the lines where it wants to, where it wants to kind of split. And you can just serve it like that. You know, just kind of break it up into pieces and serve it like that with, again, some of its sauce, because that's sort of, um, the point of this recipe. 
I'm gonna go ahead and uh, serve the pasta. Quanti minuti siamo sulla pasta? Manca, manca un minuto e trenta. Oh, okay. It's gonna be super al dente. That. I'm just breaking up some of that. There was kind of the angle of the piece of fish. I'm just breaking it up in here so that I can serve it onto the pasta. So amazingly, the mint that you've put inside of the fish, literally after sort of, you know, five minutes of cooking, all this mint starts to come out. It has perfumed the entire piece of fish is perfumed with the mint and the garlic. And then when you're eating and you come across a piece of mint and garlic, personally, I'm leaving it to the side, but some people like just, you know, eat the whole thing because the garlic at that point has just kind of seeded its flavor and it's gotten really soft. So it's very um, kind of a peculiar dish, super flavorful and just um, really, really good kind of for this time of year since it's like I said, tuna are running now. So we're in fresh tuna season. Okay, I'm gonna... 30 secondi. Okay, good. All right, I'm gonna turn off the pasta. I'm using a type of pasta, which is called um, calamaretti because it looks like, I'll show it to you. It looks like um, fried calamari. <laughs> Always makes me laugh, they call it calamaretti because it looks like calam calamari that's already been cut up. And you can find these, most Italian pasta makers make these. This was made by my uh, Heritage Grain Association up the street, but most Italian pasta makers make, um, Kind of the artisan ones anyway, make a calamaretti. So here's what they look like. Kind of big, round. You can use anything you want. And this is the recipe is actually from Palermo. And in Palermo, um, they would use, um, I believe they use spaghetti, just long spaghetti. I kind of like this kind of a rest, this kind of a pasta sauce on short pasta. Lorenzo tu che dici? Pasta corta or pasta lunga? I prefer short pasta with this, For this kind, kind of, of sauce. Right. Yeah. Right. So I'm doing, here we go, sauce. So this is a pasta asciutta, which means dry. Oh, the pasta asciutta is when you put sauce on pasta. And the idea is it's asciutta, it's dry. And that sort of distinguishes it from a minestra. And so the idea is that you really don't have just a heck of a lot of sauce on here. I'm just kind of barely coating it and getting some nice chunks of um tuna i, I think it's gets... an, uh, that's another difference uh, but it's for my opinion is the pasta shoot is dry pasta so wh uh, when you have some pasta made with the water and flour you have to dry it before cook so it's oh. for this that you use pasta shoot it's different this... because with the uh, fresh pasta is made it with uh, normally with flour and the eggs, but I think it's but is through your um, your explanation, so it's better than minestra or pasta asciutta. No, no, pensi così perché yeah, è yeah. asciutta. Yeah, yeah, I prefer to think on the other side. <laughs> but I think I'm right. Um, so yeah, here's the pasta with, and it's just, I mean, it looks like it doesn't look like much, but it's got all of this this aroma of the mint and the garlic and the tuna and the tuna has kind of mellowed out and the tomato and the tomato, the acid in the tomatoes kind of cutting the fat of the tuna and even making it soft. It's just luscious, luscious. So I hope everybody will make some tuna recipes. If you can't get fresh tuna, you can make tomato. Um, any more questions? No, for a moment. Uh, yeah, Dave, uh, I think you know David Trigiani. Say, That's Elena. <laughs> Uh, oh, I, I'm going to open your mic. Okay. Oh, okay. So if you someone want to make some question, uh, oh, he asked, well, uh, remember, we were in Cefalu when they wouldn't give me cheese for my pasta because there was a seafood in dish. Okay, I, I don't remember normal. that, but they were right. Okay, I don't yeah. remember that, but I can imagine. I can imagine my dad asking for cheese on his pasta and they're like, no, you can't have that. And here, the person who taught me how to do this literally learned how to do that. This is like college students in Palermo make this, which kind of cracks me up because college students, when I was in college, we were like eating ramen noodles, you know, and these guys are literally college students in Palermo are making that. And I said, you put even breadcrumbs on top of here because you would never put, this does not need cheese. It's a fish dish. It does not need, there are some fishes that might could use some cheese. This one does not. And I said, well, what about some breadcrumbs? Because that's very typical to Sicily is to put some just kind of crunchy, salty on top. And he said, no, not, no, you keep nothing. 
You do not put anything on top of it. You're done. So that's that. Any more questions, y'all? Comments? Y'all can open your mic and say hey if you'd like to. No questions, or I'm going to say oh, bye. I don't, I don't see. All right, y'all, thanks for tuning in. It's very good to see everybody. Again, in case you missed it, I got a first dose of vaccine. Um, so I'm very happy about that. And I kind of changed my outlook, and I can kind of see, you know, travel on the horizon. So um, I'm looking forward to kind of getting back to some sort of um, kind of normal, normal approach here. Um, what kind of wine would you drink with that? I'm going to drink the same wine that I used in the beginning, which is um, a white wine from Mount Etna. And this is, the grape is called Caricante, so Sicily, a Sicilian white wine. And this is a Caricante grape from, it's called Vino di Anna. Anna no. Martins, Australian um, enologist with um, Vignet on Mount Etna. Nice. Oh, so we, that's the Labinamento. We, we have a question, very quick. What you serve with the tornato, Vitello Tornato? Salad, salad or also side dish, the side dish? I don't know. Lorenzo, what do you serve with? I, Sal think, I say salad. Uh, or, or I, I think also uh, boiled potatoes, for example, so with some yeah. the same sauce, for example, it's good. Yeah, boiled potatoes with the same sauce that sounds good. Or a salad, yeah. It's or kind a of, salad. This is sort of, this is like, you know, light lunch kind of thing. And obviously yeah. it's a cold dish, this is more sort of a summertime type of a thing. Yeah, um, also also all, all right. other, veg, other, other boiled vegetables, so like zucchini mm -hmm. or other, but not very mm -hmm. strong flavor. Right, yeah, these, this is a strong flavor, so anything, yeah. you want, anything you put with it would be a little, you would want to kind of hold off on the flavor. Them. Yeah. yeah, that looks great. This is so making us hungry. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what you That's the point. Now, y'all, now everybody, out, everybody has to go out and find a huge chunk of tuna. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Elaine. Thanks, Elaine. It was wonderful. Yeah, it's so good to see everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Sorry about technical difficulties. We'll see you next time. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you Elaine. Thank you, Lorenzo. Thank you, Lorenzo. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye. 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 Bye.